And now on Book TV's Afterwards. Media Research Center founder and President Brent Bozell argues that the media is biased against President Trump. He's interviewed by Kerry Sheffield, Accuracy and Media National Editor. Afterwards is a weekly interview program with relevant guest hosts interviewing top nonfiction authors about their latest work. Brent, thanks so much for joining this Book Talk conversation. Thanks for having so, me. So tell us about Unmasked. Who is your intended audience, and what's the biggest takeaway you want them to get? Well, uh, when we were approached by Newsmax to, to do this book, my initial reaction was I didn't want to do it. Uh, and Tim Graham, my co-author, felt the way, same way because we thought, you know, what else can we write about that everyone doesn't know already about the press? So I said to Tim, why don't you go take all the research and go look it over for a week and come back and tell me what you think. He came back and we discussed it and we thought, my goodness, there's a book here. And the, 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 the book is the narrative and, and the fact that it, it, it's prologue to what's going to follow in the next year in the sense that if you look at this uh, coverage of Donald Trump from day one uh, up until the present, you're going to see uh, the story about a man who has dominated press coverage unlike any figure in American history and who has received in return the worst coverage of any man in history, not just quantitatively, which, which, which is a series of, of uh, studies, but qualitatively, not just in the, in the percent of negative coverage, but in the tonality of it. And you put it all together, and it's stunning to see what's happened in the last three years. I think we've heard so much of it, we're just not listening anymore. Um, but if you look at this coverage, you'll see the degree to which the media have changed. The biggest takeaway is... I truly believe, and we write about this in the book, this has been an attempt to destroy uh, a president, to nullify the democratic process. But I think at the end of the day, many of these media operations have destroyed themselves. Well, and that's certainly uh, what you mentioned in, in the first chapter, that you said that Donald J. Trump understood that the news media were his most powerful enemy, hell-bent on preventing his election and when that failed, destroying his presidency. So he went to war. This is the story of a media that set out to destroy a president and his administration, but destroyed themselves instead. That's very powerful words that you said, that the media destroyed themselves. In what way do you think the media has destroyed itself? Well, let's look at the at their credibility. Their credibility is everything for, for uh, the news media. If you don't have that, um, you, you, you are nothing but the National Enquirer. Um, and if you don't have credibility, people aren't going to watch you anymore. Uh, they're not going to look at you for, for, for news or for truth. Uh, look at the numbers of these networks. Uh, they're, 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 they're crashing. Um, the, the most uh, telling numbers, I think, would be CNN. Um, CNN, you know, it, it once was the gold standard of journalism. Go back 25 years ago with Bernie Shaw when he was the anchor of it. Uh, did it have a liberal bias? Sure, it did. But you could work with CNN. You could work with Tom Johnson, the president of CNN. You could sit down and have a, a frank conversation with them. And, and sometimes they agreed, and they would change the story. Even Ted Turner um, could, could, could hear you out. Uh, that was CNN then. CNN Today uh, clearly wants no conservatives, uh, clearly is on a, a, a mission against Donald Trump. And its audience clearly is leaving. The numbers, uh, last time I checked, 500, in a nation of 330 million, 571,000 viewers on a good night. Now, to put that one in perspective, that's two-tenths of 1% of the American population. That's what it's reaching now. To put that in its proper perspective, there are more people who own pet chickens <laughs> then watch CNN. Well, but is, that, is that to be fair, though? That, what about digital numbers, social media, impressions? Oh, I mean, they're, they're, that, they are expanding yeah, let, their digital let, let, We'll go there in a second. I've got, I got to finish my fun story, but you're absolutely right. There are more practicing witches than there are viewers of CNN. And my favorite, there are more prostitutes in America than there are viewers of CNN. I'm not sure what that one means. 
Now, does that mean CNN um, is completely irrelevant? <laughs> no, 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 no. Go to CNN.com. CNN.com has got about 20 million people on its site. But what's the difference between CNN.com and CNN? You'll get a lot more news on CNN.com than you'll get on CNN. There, it's like CBS.com is a quite good uh, 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 place to go. CBS is not. Uh, Fox. Fox has got 26 million uh, coming to its site. Fox.com. So, you know, I'll tell people, if you want to get uh, your story out, uh, Fox News is nice. Foxnews.com is the place to go. So, CNN.com has, has a, an audience, but where it comes to the, to the institution of CNN, that thing you see in the airports, that thing you see in the dentist's office, people aren't watching it anymore. So in terms of the, uh, you know, another quote you have from the book, it says that it was clear from the start that Donald Trump was itching for a fight with the media. He was going to, he was going to put the entire profession on trial in the court of public opinion. And he did that by introducing two words that within a year had become part of the political lexicon, fake news. How do you define fake news in your words? Well, in, in the book we discussed it there because that has to be um, explained. There are different gradations of this. It begins with, with media bias. There is Media bias is the distortion of a story, uh, the twisting of a story to, to, to bend to the political worldview of the author. You can have two kinds of bias in that direction. You can have the bias by commission where you move things. It's the title, it's the people you interview, it's the spin you put, it's the labeling you put, it's the conclusion you reach is the headline. It's all different ways. Then there's the bias by omission, which is just the opposite. It is the refusal to write a story, to do a story, to, to, to label people, to, to give the other side of the story, to put a complete headline, to give the proper conclusion. Those are all biased by omission. That's the first level. I think the second level is false news. A false news is a story that somebody reports Unwitting, not unwittingly, but but uh, unknowingly. Now, this is oftentimes a reflection of poor journalism. Uh, you know, once upon a time, Carrie, uh, uh, journalism 101 was two independent sources, or you don't have a news story. And now people are just rushing to come out with anything they can to be the first kids on the block with a story, uh, which which makes for bad journalism. But then the top layer is fake news. Fake news is the, the publishing of news stories you know are not true, you know have not been vetted, you know uh, could be absolutely untrue. That's fake news. That's a harsh, harsh indictment on, on, the, uh, on the industry. I'll give you a micro and I'll give you a macro. A micro story. Uh, uh, Brian Ross of ABC wrote breathlessly a story about how Trump had sent Mike Flynn to Russia to talk to the Russians. Boom. There's your evidence. Candidate Trump. There's your story. Would you stop beating me <laughs> to the punch? That's the point. That's the point. He wrote it as President Trump. Right. National Security Advisor had sent him. Boom. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Candidate Trump. Right. He had, then he said Candidate Trump. And that meant collusion. And that meant that the stock market dropped 300 points. And this was serious, serious guacamole. Yeah, because when, uh, when he's president, that's normal protocol to send a national security advisor for the transition. But when exactly you're a candidate... What he done. That's exactly what he had done. Brian Ross was suspended. He ended up uh, uh, retiring or resigning. And Brian whatever Ross, you want to call. just if, if viewers don't know, he had been the most senior invest, investigative yeah. reporter for ABC. Well, for, for years and years. Once upon a time, very highly respected. He might disagree with some things here or there, but he was a uh, he was a uh, 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 really the, the the central casting when it came to investigative reporting. That's the micro. Now look at the macro. This entire Russia collusion story has been one big exercise in fake news. Consider this, Carrie. I don't care what you think of Donald Trump. I don't care what anybody thinks of Donald Trump. The facts are that from day one. He said, there's not one scintilla of evidence. From day one, no one ever, no reporter, 
no politician, no public policy organization, no legal outfit, no one ever delivered one scintilla of evidence. And yet, and we looked at this, Rich Noyes, my colleague, published a report, just under 20% of all news stories since Donald Trump was president have dealt with Russia collusion. Think about all the economic stories on, on, on unemployment, on taxes, on spending, goes on and on. All the stories on foreign policy, on ISIS, on Russia, on China, on North Korea, on Iran. All the stories on social policy, all the stories on politics, the thousands of directions. And yet 20% of all news stories dealt with something that didn't exist. That's so fake news. Would, so you, do you think the Mueller report was fake news? I think the whole investigation was fake news. And look, what, what Bob Mueller came out with in his report was just that. He said, there's nothing. There's nothing there. The real question is, what in the world was going on with our government? What was going on that triggered an investigation that would derail a presidency, that would undo a presidency that had top justice officials attempting to defeat Donald Trump and prevent his presidency. There's a much bigger issue that we've been dealing at with so far. Let's see if they're going to investigate. Let's see if any reporter thinks it's interesting. You know, there are a couple, John Solomon and a couple of others, have tackled this, but no one's looking at this. I think it's going to change because Bob Barr is investigating it. And then now let's see what happens when the media have to cover it. It's going to be interesting. Well, and it's interesting because even the mainstream media now has been reporting about the average voter and how they feel about the Mueller report or Bob Mueller or they don't know. They don't either. They don't know or they don't care. And that's for them. CNN even did a list of of issues that, uh, you know, they care about. And literally zero percent said Mueller and the Mueller investigation. So why do you think there is such a disconnect between what voters care about and what the media chooses to can't cover. Because the media are, are, not, are not covering news anymore. They're covering, you know, news is a very subjective thing. Leslie Midgley, who was Walter Cronkite's longtime producer, wrote a book, How Many Words Do You Want? And in it, half of it dealt with his days in, as a newspaper man, and he asked in the print media, what is news? And he said, news is what the editor says it is. And then the second half dealt with television. He said, what is news? And the answer was, news is what the producer says it is. And that's, in fact, what news is. What CNN and company have wanted to be news is that, that, he, that, that this was collusion and Bob Mueller was going to uncover it. And what happened is all along, the, the American people have been yawning, saying, we don't buy it. We don't see anything here. It's like climate change. Climate change is another one. You've been seeing that as a top shelf concern. I'm picking on CNN, but CNN has been the worst on climate change. New York Times, too. Um, New York Times has been terrible about this. And yet, if you look at the public's perception on this, I don't care how many stories are out there, it doesn't move the public. They're just, that's bottom of the pile for the public. Um, They're not, they could defend themselves by saying, look, it's not our business to give the public what the public wants. It's our business to give them them the news. And, And I'll accept that. But by the same token... After all these stories, the, the, what the public is saying is, is, is you're, you're not giving me anything that's moving my opinion at all. Well, as someone who's been a guest on CNN, what, what they usually say, what the anchors will say or the contributors in response to a conservative who says that argument, that there was nothing here, was that, well, there were multiple indictments that were produced from this. There were uh, multiple uh, it, we, we know more about the extent to which Ru- Russians were interfering in our process. So this, this investigation was worthwhile. So that for you to say that it's fake news is, is disingenuous, not to mention that a lot of Republicans welcomed the Mueller investigation as a way to, to clear the president. Well, you know, the, the answer would be yes, and every single uh, indictment dealt with something about, involving someone who had nothing to do with Donald Trump. And the central investigation, the central investigation was, did the Trump administration, did the Trump campaign collude with the Russians? And the bottom line is the answer is no. There was never any evidence. And all this other stuff had nothing to do with that. You know, I love it that 13 Russians, whoever, who's, we'll, we'll never know who they are, they were indicted too. You know, there's one, one question that was raised. 
Uh, one line of questioning that was raised by one Republican yesterday I thought was really interesting. Who tipped CNN off on that, that outrageous raid on Roger Stone's home? It doesn't matter whether Roger Stone was innocent or is innocent or guilty. The fact that this you know, almost 70-year-old man would be ha- have this kind of Inchon Landing attack on his house at 6 o'clock in the morning, and CNN was tagging along. You know, uh, Bob Mueller said, well, you know, there wasn't any leak. Of course there was a leak that went on. I'd like to know, who was calling CNN and say, tag along, watch what we do to Roger Stone? That was really out of balance, and that should be investigated. So one thing you look in the book is uh, you make the argument about the difference of Republicans versus Democrats and how they're treating the press. And, and one argument you make is, is how the press treated Ken Starr versus how they treated Bob Mueller. Do you think now that the, the, the Mueller testimony has happened, do you think the press will turn on Bob Mueller? I think they did already. I think they, the, the media turned on him. You know, it's interesting. When he came out with his press conference and said... Uh, that Donald Trump was innocent on on the collusion charge. There was there was about twelve to twenty four hours of stunned silence from the news media that didn't know what to do because they all expected all of them expected that he was going to come out with something serious against the president. Um, but then the, the the Democrats, Jerry Nadler and company, started beating the drums about well. This ain't over yet, and we're going to investigate it because, you know, 16 lawyers and gazillions of dollars and three years later, they didn't do their job, so we're going to do it. And the media pivoted to, to the Democrats and just started following, going down that road. Yeah, we're going to get to the truth now. And basically, they threw Mueller under the bus. After three years of declaring what an honorable man he was, he was useless to them. So now came the testimony. And the testimony, uh, the congressional testimony, was going to get to the bottom of exactly what was happening. And it was um, Mueller 2.0. It was this time with, with uh, the man looking very frail uh, and very unsure of himself and very ill-prepared. Um, this thing backfired tremendously. Again, 12 hours of stunned silence. The Democrats now are pounding, saying it was those Republicans. And the media are starting to go right back to them again. So it's kind of interesting how it's repeating itself. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and one theme certainly in your book over and over is, is the low level of trust in the institution of media. I, I want to get your thoughts on something that you talked about with Barack Obama and the coverage of him. Your book, you say that Senator Obama, uh, you quoted someone uh, saying that Senator Obama has gotten, it was a friend of Obama, and uh, they had joked that Senator Obama has gotten such great publicity all his life that one of his friends joked to me this morning, he's throwing his halo into the ring. So to what extent... Great line, isn't it? Yeah, it's a great line. Um, <laughs> uh, to what extent do you think that the victory of Donald Trump, who is certainly incredibly anti-establishment and is tearing at, at the institution of, of media, um, to what extent do you think Barack Obama's presidency and the coverage of him contributed to the rise of Donald Trump? Uh, interesting. I think that I think Barack Obama triggered Trump in the sense two ways. One that. Barack Obama was kind of the outside, was an outsider. I've been saying for years that a Republican businessman was going to run for president. For years I've been saying that. And I think Barack Obama, in a way, uh, allowed that to happen because Obama was an outsider in his own right. He wasn't an establishment figure. Um, so I think the country was getting a little bit used to, is getting a little bit used to outside figures. Um, however, it was also... The reason, one of the three reasons why there's such hostility to Donald Trump, it was that Donald Trump announced from the get-go and said, stated that it was his intention to undo what Barack Obama had done. Barack Obama talked about the fundamental transformation of America. Donald Trump said, we're going to undo that. And he went through a whole litany of issues. Well, the God, and, clean the God, guns, and religion that Obama had sought to dismantle. Yeah, and, and Trump, you know, Playboy Trump went right to the to, to the evangelicals. I mean, right. who'd, who'd and, have thought? And you, and you quoted heavily from President Trump's speech in Poland, where oh, he referenced yeah. God repeatedly and, re- and referenced the Catholic faith in Poland and, and the shared culture of a faith in God. 
uh, to what extent do you think that the evangelical, uh, you know, perception of, of how the Obama presidency treated them maybe contributed to Donald Trump's rise as well? Well, I think it did. I think, I think, I think uh, uh, the evangelicals decided that they were going to put their faith in a very flawed human being. Um, but it was a flawed human being who was saying to them, A, I'm flawed, and B, I'm going to continue being flawed, um, but uh, I am going to deliver on what I promise. And I think uppermost was abortion. Here's an interesting thing that that people, I don't know if enough people realize this. You know, I, I can make the argument that Donald Trump is the most pro-life president in history. Well, who would have thunk that one? But think about this. He's the first presidential candidate ever, underscore ever, to promise a pro-life Supreme Court justice. Do you know no one's ever done that before? No yeah, one's you mentioned ever... that in the book, and I was surprised. I thought maybe Ronald Reagan had promised or so. George W. Bush. No one. A strict constructionist, originalist, all the code words. No one's ever said pro-life. Donald Trump said it in every speech. And then he gave a list of 20 judges, the justices, you know, potential justices. So I think that really registered. And then, uh, what did he do with this, the first Right to Life march? Uh, he sent his vice president. And then he spoke at it last year. This is something that Republicans don't do. Um, and he immediately put Gorsuch on there, who's pro-life. Kavanaugh, we're going to assume, is pro-life. Not entirely sure of that, but we're going to assume he is. So he delivered on those promises. And I think the evangelical camp uh, was and continues to be very, very happy with the man. These are... These are some strange times we're living in that we never thought would happen, but but it is happening. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk about your relationship with Trump because you talk about it in the book and how uh, you report that President Trump, well, at the time, he hadn't even declared yet, but then potential candidate Trump reached out to you and asked for lunch at Trump Tower. And, and you, you met with him and, and you said that he pushed back softly and gently two words I would have thought could never appear in a, se a sentence also containing the word Trump. Uh, you described him as full of humility and graciousness. This was 3.5 months before he had declared. Uh, and then you said after he declared, and he was very braggadocious, and you said that the man I met was nowhere to be found now that he was on stage. There wasn't a hint of humility or gentility or thoughtfulness or kindness, all the things he'd shown me. So why do you think, in your opinion, does the president embrace a persona that seems to be so different from the person that you met privately. And do you think this hurts him with the female suburban voters, with minority voters who may, maybe this persona isn't their, their, their cup of tea? Well, very good question. And I'm not alone. Uh, many people have said the same thing, that in private it's a very different person. I was stunned. I mean, I, the perception is, is what, what I went into uh, believing I was going to, I was going to get. And as I, I, I wrote in the book, uh, it was just the opposite. A thoughtful, quiet, inquisitive, humble. Um, uh, and there was, he was bragging about that. But, but you know, it, it was a very different man. And I left that meeting thinking, my God, if America sees this man, uh, this guy, this guy's going places. And then immediately he did that. Now, why did he do that? Why did he go braggadocious, loudmouth, all that kind of stuff? He's a master marketer. He understood something about politics that uh, I that that Barack again in a Barack Obama moment. Obama fundamentally changed politics in America. Obama made took the equation that says that in a in a in a primary campaign the Democrats go for their liberal base, the Republicans go for their conservative base. In the general, they fight over the middle. Threw that all aside. He said, my minority base, not black, but, but lesser numbers than the Republicans, my left-wing minority base, is if I can get them more agitated, more mobilized, I can beat up your majority base to the Republicans. And that's just what he did twice. And he used social media to do it, Facebook. Donald Trump reversed it. He did it right back to the Democrats. He got his base so worked up that his because he could never get 50%, they said in the polls, his base beat up the Democrats, and he used social media as well. So he replicated Barack Obama. 
But to what extent, to the, the question earlier, in 2018, Republicans lost the House. Mm. Do you think that some of this was related to tone or the persona that is public versus who the man is privately? Oh, I think it has something to do with it, yeah. Now, you can say, well, in the off year, the, the incumbent party loses X amount, and this true. You can say there was a whole swath of resignations of retirements with the Republicans, and that was true. At the end of the day... Uh, I don't think he won new friends between 2016 and 2018. Also, his popularity, I'm not so sure his popularity goes downstream. And it, it transmits itself um, to, to, to the Republicans at the state or local level. I don't know that it does. I don't know that it isn't just Well, and certainly forced. many of the seats that were lost by the Republicans were from members who had been either lukewarm or had not embraced him. Yep. Well, they, when put it this way, when when Donald Trump goes into a district or a state and he says, "I don't like the Republican in there," yeah, yeah, his base uh, jumps up. Barbara Comstock, my own congresswoman, um, that's what he did, and that's what happened to her. So it did happen in several places. But I think at the end of the day, with with Trump, it's it's very much almost a cult of personality. It was with Obama as well. It was the same thing. Obama didn't translate necessarily downstream. Um, I think, and so, so 28, I don't think is a bellwether. I think 2020, 2020 is going to be a fascinating, fascinating year. Um, no one knows where it's going. Everyone's making wild predictions. But I will say, and you saw it in the book, you know how everybody states today, well, I knew Donald Trump was going to win. And the foregone conclusion, I think I am the only person who's willing to put in writing that when he asked, I looked the future president in the eye and I told him there was absolutely no way he could win. So there. Well, and, and you mentioned in the book, too, that even Fox News, uh, several weeks out from the election, were projecting that, that Trump would lose as well. Oh, he, so, all, all the experts. All, I yeah. mean, one or two people. I mean, the, the, the one public figure who I think has the greatest um, laughing moment today is Ann Coulter. Uh, when she went on Bill Maher's show, and she was asked who she thought was going to win. She said him. And I mean, the audience fell apart in laughter as they all laughed at her. I think she's, she's the one who's got the greatest last laugh. Yeah. Well, and you were, uh, <coughs> you were at one point a Trump skeptic. So you wrote an op-ed for National Review uh, calling out some of the critiques that you had against him. But you, once he won the primary, you didn't join the hashtag never Trump ranks. So that in the primary you had concerns and, and your, your, your guy was Ted Cruz. Um, to what extent did you see, you've got a donor base, obviously not disclosing what you can't, but to what extent was your donor base torn? Because when you think of the donor class within the conservative movement, it tends to be, quote unquote, more establishment or maybe they're successful business people, the quote unquote, chamber of commerce wing. To what extent did, did you feel pressure from the establishment who might have felt your, your initial uh, reticence to Trump? with donors who were more populist or, or really embraced him? You know, you know, I guess in a way it didn't affect us that much because we're a 501c3 organization and the MRC doesn't endorse, doesn't take sides there. Personally, I can do whatever I want um, as long as I, I do so personally. Uh, there were people in both camps. Uh, I, I had people who were upset with me for uh, not supporting Trump. I had people who were upset with me because they thought I was supporting Trump. And uh, with some people, you just can't win. Um, and it really did happen on both ends. Look, I, where that National Review piece is concerned, it's unfortunate that not Trump became never Trump. That, that piece... That, are, that, that uh, edition of National Review was titled Not Trump. And against Trump, wasn't it? Maybe it was against Trump. Against Trump. <laughs> I was. know this because I've talked to many National Review people and they say it was against Trump. Yeah. It was not never Trump. Yeah, yeah okay, it was against <laughs> Trump. And, and, but that's exactly what it was. I had endorsed Ted Cruz. I was asked to, to submit a piece as to why I was supporting Ted Cruz over Donald Trump. And in the book, I, 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 I reprint exactly what I wrote. I stand by it. And it was that Donald Trump didn't walk with conservatives like Ronald Reagan did. Uh, he walked with liberals. It's a simple point. Well, unfortunately, that edition became the Bible 
for never Trump. There were some people within National Review who were and continue to be very vocal, vocally anti-Trump, and they were in that piece. There were some who aren't in there. But everybody got thrown in there. Uh, I was, as a recount, I was the recipient of a rather interesting... A hate tweet. About well, that hate tweet. At Brent Bazell, one of the National Review lightweights, came to my office begging for money like a dog. Why doesn't he say that? <laughs> it was kind of interesting because there's pretty much not a word, and that was accurate. Um, I, I didn't come to him uh, asking for money. I came to him because he invited me to lunch to talk about the campaign. We never talked about the Media Research Center. At the end of the campaign, at the end of the lunch, he asked me if he had supported the Media Research Center, and I said that no, he hadn't, and he sent a check afterwards. So it really wasn't what he had said, and uh, my wife was not happy with that, but it was what it was, and off to the races we went. Well, uh, the language in the tweet where he said he called you, did you beg for money like a dog? I found that to be interesting because that's a phrase that he had used to describe Omarosa, you know, fired her like a dog, uh, and he's used this phrase against multiple people, men and women, yet somehow when he uses it against a woman, he's called a sexist. Yep. So what's your take as someone who is conservative? You talked about civility, gentility, humility. When the, when the president uses language like that, do you think that the media uh, is unfair in presenting the fact that is, is he truly sexist, racist, the way they're presenting, or is he more of an equal combatant uh, and that side just isn't presented. Um, if, I, if, if, if I am speaking out of turn with him, I apologize. But I do believe it was Brian Williams who filed a story asking if, I, I'm, not, I've, I'm not making this up, if Donald Trump was anti-dog. Uh, did, they actually did a story about it. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody did. Buy the book and you'll read it. It's, yeah, it's, it's in, in the there. book, yeah. Um, uh, you know, <clears throat> sorry for this cold. Talk about the pot calling the kettle black. Isn't it a fascinating how the media are constantly um, savaging the president for the language he uses while calling him a Nazi, while calling him a fascist, while calling him every kind of despicable name um, you could you could hurl at the president of the United States. Um, this is, again, this is one of the things that, uh, of the findings of the book, that all modicum of decency has been cast aside, but not from Donald Trump to his opponents, but from his opponents to him. They call him far worse things. They are attempting to do far worse to him than what they accused him of doing to them. It, 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 it's telling. They have no right, none. What you have a right I have a right, these books have a right to pass judgment on Donald Trump's language. The press doesn't. No, I, uh, you pointed out a Washington Post editorial that compared uh, the the prospect of, of uprooting illegal immigrants and, and deporting them to Pol Pot, the dictator, executing people yeah, yeah. And, and the hyperbole and how that's that's the normalized, that's the Washington Post. It's not uh, you know a blog coming from the nation or something like that. Oh, this whole, you know, again, if you were going to report what is happening at the border, honestly, have you noticed one thing, Carrie? Whatever happened to those caravans? Remember all those stories about the tens of thousands of people that were marching in America and then the story disappeared? Guess what? They're the ones who are crossing the border right now. The media aren't reporting in effect. America is being invaded, and they're being America is being invaded in a very bad way by by some very bad people. In the book, we cite the flip side to all the negative about Donald Trump. You know, when you've got 92, 93, 91, 89 percent negative coverage, then you know you do have Paul Pot, uh, unless the stories are inaccurate. So, what good has he done? In fact, if you look at the litany of accomplishments, it's rather extraordinary. Things I didn't know as of October of 2018. One thing I didn't know was as of October of 2018, when you talk about those border things, 100, he had, his administration had apprehended 
127,000 illegal immigrants with criminal records. Now, in all those stories being done about what's going on on the border, don't you think there's room for that story to be told? No one's reporting that one. Well, and you, the book goes through a lot of different ratios of, of coverage, uh, talking about, you know, for NBC News, spent 18 seconds on the best unemployment numbers in 50 years, but more than two minutes to talk about how cast member from the SNL, uh, Keenan Thompson, had been on staff for 16 years. And, and the book uh, portrays an, or reports on a number of interesting you know, statistics. The, the Bureau of Labor Statistics job stats, positive days, uh, released uh, coverage of those statistics and, and the historic you know, unemployment lows for black, Latino, Asian Americans, women, um, the ratio of 60 to 1 versus Russia investigation. So things that are actually affecting people's lives versus things that voters don't care about to our conversation earlier. Sure. This ratio is, is, is incredibly skewed. I, I'm curious to, you, you quote in the book also Jeff Jarvis, uh, an NYU journalism professor, uh, about right after Trump won. And he said that, I fear that journalism is irredeemably broken, a failure. My profession failed to inform the public about the fascists they are electing. This is from a journalism professor. So I'm curious, uh, do you, uh, how, to what extent this pipeline, so this is clearly uh, an ongoing issue, as you document in the book, about the way the press has treated Democrats in the past uh, and today. Uh, this is decades in the making, arguably going back at least to the 1960s culture wars. Um, to what extent do journalism schools realize that they're creating a pipeline problem here, that yeah. they are the ones who are inculcating this, this seething bias into their students? You know, I wish that um, journalism schools would have a, a uh, mandatory internship for their students in which they, for one year, the journalism students had to have real jobs. And they had to go work in real America and go visit Indiana uh, and see how the real world uh, operates. This is an institution where people go from you know, Ivy League schools to Columbia Journalism, uh, a School of Journalism, to the New York Times. They never set foot in America. They, never, they don't understand real world experiences. They don't understand how the economy works. They don't not understand the idea of investment, of sacrifice. They don't know how to hire somebody. They don't know the pain of having to lay somebody off. That's a world that's unknown to them. And I say it tongue in cheek, but I, I do believe that there that in a real way, journalists need to to understand what in the world they're talking about before they pass judgment on all these things. Um, they they have worked themselves up into such a messianic frenzy, uh, especially over this man. That I mean, he is tipping the apple cart. He he's going against the narrative. I don't know how many more cliches I can <laughs> come up with, uh, but 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 it's what he's doing. And therefore, you'll get a Jeff Jarvis that just see how he seamlessly threw out the word fascist. Imagine if you seamlessly threw out the word communist with Barack Obama. How long he'd last? Right. Well, and and you know, to the, to the point on education versus what's already in the industry. So when you have your book talks about the New York Times, David Brooks saying that if we're going to get Trump, we might as well get the Nuremberg rallies to go with it. George Stephanopoulos saying the number of prominent people comparing Trump to Hitler is growing by the day. Carl Bernstein, the legendary journalist who took down uh, Richard Nixon, called Trump a neo-fascist. And you, you go through the book systematically and document the extent to which these words are thrown around very casually. Um, in terms of the, the demographics, when you look at this future, so thinking about the future, the millennial population is 44% non-white. And when we're looking at voting patterns dating back to 1964, 6% of black voters voted for Barry Goldwater. But before that, in 1956, it was uh, you know, something like 39% or 29, 30, low 30s uh, for Dwight Eisenhower, similar for Richard Nixon in 1960. And it was 1964 when it fell to 6%. And it's, it's always been now for generations with black voters, single digits. One time, I believe it broke 10%. For black voters, so when you have multi-generational black voters having such skepticism for the conservative movement, uh, what does that say going forward? Especially, you know, looking the babies born today are majority mm -hmm. non-white. Uh, you know, the growing Latino population. You looking at the future, 
what's the future for the conservative movement if the media is so entrenched in these these anti-conservative narratives, particularly as it relates to minorities? I guess it depends on what conservatives do. Um, there might be some kind of tectonic shifts taking place here. I don't know if it's temporary or I don't know if it's permanent. But here's what I do know. The Republican establishment is irrelevant to the public conversation. Nobody cares what the United States Senate believes about anything. Let's face it. Um, the House is just one step behind that in irrelevancy where the Republican Party is concerned. Uh, it's in deep, deep trouble. Uh, the reason there's a Republican president is partially because that Republican president spent half his time going against the Republican Party. Um, and, and, and that's the only reason he's there. Um, he became a populist, and he attracted blacks. I think he made a mistake in the campaign. He went to Detroit, and twice he said, uh, what, what do you have to lose? Yeah, um, your community's terrible. Yeah, cute line to use, but he should have had a program. And he should have uh, offered some kind of a Jack Kempian um, um, Enterprise Zone program for them. He didn't do it. I hope he does. If he does, I think he's going to move. He's, the Latino vote is moving. He's going to move the black vote with him as well. <laughs> what does that do to Republicans? I don't know. Where conservatives are concerned, what Donald Trump showed is that it is high time conservatives stood up to the press. He didn't defend himself. He went to war against them. And as we explain in the book, he, he started this with them. They didn't start it with him. He started it with them. But he showed how they can be defeated. And he did defeat them. So where the conservative movement is concerned, either they learn a lesson from him or they just may be knocked into irrelevancy after him. Well, and uh, he would say that with criminal justice reform, <laughs> opportunity zones, record unemployment, the help for his historically black colleges and universities, that he's certainly looking to move the needle. But the uh, over and over, you talk about the Republican establishment as being disconnected from grassroots conservatives. Who, who, what figures do you see out there as bridging that divide in, in the movement beyond uh, Donald Trump? Uh, to some degree, the Freedom Caucus, you know, it's kind of interesting. Once upon a time, uh, Republican was synonymous with conservative when it came to Congress. During the Reagan years, everybody wanted to be a Reaganite. Everybody was a Reagan conservative. Um, today, you've got this little Freedom Caucus in the House, and they are, they are the conservatives in the House. You've got a handful, I don't think more than a handful, of Republicans in the Senate that are conservatives. Uh, oh, everybody, when they run for re-election, everybody's a conservative because that's how you get elected. But there's uh, nothing more than a handful of them. Uh, I think they are the ones who have the future. It's the Rand Pauls, it's the Mike Lees, it's the Ted Cruz's, maybe Ben Sass, uh, maybe one or two more. They're the only conservatives in town. Um, the question is, how long can the Republicans keep up this facade of being conservatives when you see... Uh, them being no different than the Democrats when it comes to economic issues, foreign policy issues. They're really no different. Um, and when you try to out-Democrat a Democrat, the Democrat always wins. Well, and what about this budget bill that was just agreed upon and President Trump has said he's going to sign? Do you think that that betrays the conservative grassroots? Sure it does. Sure it does. And it's unfortunate that the president would do that from the standpoint that uh, this is the one thing we just know every Republican even Democrats, too, run on the idea of fiscal conservatism, why we're going to stop this crazy spending, why our children and their children and their children are going to be affected by this, why it's irresponsible. And then Republicans did nothing but point the finger at the Democrats during the Obama years when the debt was doubled. Now the Democrats are pointing the fingers at the Republicans, and they're all, they're all supporting it. All presidents are signing them. George Bush signed all these things. Barack Obama signed all these bills. And now President Trump is doing this. So, you know, there's going to be a comeuppance. But unfortunately, it's not going to be us. It's going to be our children and our grandchildren who are really going to suffer because of what's being done today. 
In terms of the what's next for the press, so now that the Mueller testimony has happened, the report's out, the media has been, you even said yourself, uh, the, the ratio of stories about the Mueller investigation was truly incredible. Um, what, what's next for the press in terms of their strategy in covering President Trump now that this, this Mueller uh, knight in shining armor has disappointed them? They, they are truly flummoxed, aren't they? What do they do? They have been vested uh, hook, line, and sinker on the proposition that there was going to be a real possibility of removing this man from office. That, and, and not only a possibility, but a, a, a calling and a justification for it. Well, all these things have disappeared. Meanwhile, you've got the radicals in the, Cong- in the House that are agitating for it. You know, I love it that Nancy Pelosi is a moderate suddenly. Uh, I don't know what planet we're on when she is, but uh, let's assume she is, you know, she, she is a moderate compared to some of those radicals. Um, the media th- will, will give continued oxygen to those radicals. Um, and, it's, and Nancy Pelosi knows it's going to royally backfire on everybody. And I think it's going to royally backfire on the news media because, the, again, the public is seeing this for what it is. They're saying, they, everyone saw yesterday that the emperor wore no clothes um, and they're beating a dead horse. And gosh, I'm going on cliches again. Mm-hmm. i got to stop so this. So the book, you talk about uh, USA Today, Quinnipiac, uh, polling on uh, the media and how the, the divide between... Republican respondents and Democratic respondents to this polling about the media. And Democrats believe the media is generally on their side, and Republicans generally believe that the media is against their side. To what extent does the media not realize the Republicans themselves are telling them how to mitigate the lack of trust in the media? Why doesn't the media understand your consumers are expressly, if, if you were trying to sell soap, or you were trying to sell some other product and your consumers were giving you feedback about the product, uh, why wouldn't you listen to them? There, there, there's a fallacy that says that business trumps politics. No, it doesn't. Politics trumps business when it comes to the news media um, for, the, for, that, for that reason. Um, let's go back to CNN. Uh, uh, I won't say who it was, but CNN has had an, uh, an endless number of presidents in recent years. One of them was someone I knew a good fellow, and he had been involved in another network on the West Coast, and he'd always said to me, look, it's all about the numbers. It's all about the numbers. We only care about the numbers. I said, okay. So he's named president of CNN, and I called him, and I said, I'm going to do you a favor, and uh, I'm going to do you two favors, and you're going to owe me forever. And he said, oh, that's awful. No, what, what are they? And I said, the first one is get on CNN 1 or whatever your aircraft is, go to Palm Beach, bring a checkbook, um, ask around, try to find directions for this guy Rush Limbaugh's house, go to his house, knock on the door, open up your checkbook, sign it, a blank check, give it to him, tell him he can fill it in for whatever amount he wants and do whatever he wants. And in one week, you'll have the number one network on television. That's all you have to do. And he said, well, what's your second idea? And I said, whatever you do, don't pick a fight with Roger Ailes. He chews, he chews roofing nails for breakfast. Well, this guy did, and he lost his job as a result. But the point was, if you're CNN and you want to regain your audience, well, within 15 seconds, a market analysis will tell you the conservatives left. Bring back, don't, don't go in the conservative standpoint. Just even out, balance out your network coverage. Go back to news, and you're going to bring conservatives back. They'd rather go down in flames than do that. MSNBC would rather go down in flames. All these networks. Look at Fox. If you're looking at this as a business proposition, the big kid on the block is Fox. So what do they do? They do the opposite of Fox. They know what they're doing. They'd rather go down in flames than do what Fox is doing. So uh, in the book, you touch on the topic a little bit, but you don't get too much into it on the issue of uh, technology and Facebook and Twitter and conservatives and the perception that there is ideological bias against conservatives and that suppresses the algorithms for journalists who are producing conservative content. Do you think that big tech should be broken up? 
Too soon to tell. The question is, uh, one, is, it, is there a need to do something? And the answer is yes, uh, because all of them have gone in this direction where they are casting aside, even though they continue to say they are the open marketplace of ideas and they have that, that, that legal protection uh, against defamation and libel by doing that. Uh, but they're clearly throwing their lot uh, with the left. And so the question becomes, will they change course? I don't know. I don't think they will. If they don't, then can you compete against them? Could uh, another Facebook emerge? Could another Twitter emerge? Could another Google emerge? When you look at the power that these companies have, how are you going to compete against Apple with a trillion dollars in cash? (laughs) <laughs> Excuse me. How can you compete with Facebook when they are, they're reaching 2.2 billion people across the globe? How are you going to compete with Google when it has 92% of search engines? Uh, that has to be explored. If you can't compete with them, then you've got antitrust issues. And that is the quintessential conservative position. You've got to have competition. It's too soon to tell whether you can or you can't be competitive in that in that sphere. Do you think if the Trump administration ends up looking at this as a trust issue, would he face, what's the comparison with Teddy Roosevelt? Do you see President Trump as a potential Teddy Roosevelt figure because that was Teddy Roosevelt's, uh, you know, claim to fame, one of many, was the trust buster figure, the, the rough rider, the outsider, the rough and tumble uh, person unafraid to challenge the establishment? Yeah, it's the populist. But guess what? That's Elizabeth Warren, too. Um, isn't it interesting that, that you know, I, I, see, I, I see in the future, I see a left-right alliance on a number of different issues against the middle. Um, where it comes to corporate America, you're seeing more and more people on the right who are looking at big business and saying it's corrupt, and it's corrupting Washington. And everybody knows that in this city, they run, they run the show. Guess what? On the left, they're saying the same thing. Um, that's an interesting dynamic that's emerging. Where antitrust is concerned, you've got Ted Cruz and you've got Elizabeth Warren. Um, and Donald Trump is going in the Ted Cruz direction, too. And what's their message? It's very populist by both of them. Now, I think they're motivated by different things. I think Elizabeth Warren is motivated by, by, by uh, uh, believing they're too wealthy. And Ted Cruz is motivated by believing they're too powerful. But you see this burgeoning alliance that might be brewing here. Interesting dynamics. Mm -hmm. So if we had the editor-in-chief of the New York Times and the president of CNN and any number of other executives here in this conversation with us, what would you say to them? And what's what's your advice for them in terms of looking at the country? Because certainly an argument I hear over and over from people who are critics of Donald Trump is that he is he's dividing the country. Mm. Uh, to what extent are these national media outlets dividing the country? Oh, they have been for years. Um, I would tell them that um, when, if we were all meeting here, when I walked out, there would not be a need to fumigate this room. Uh, but that's the belief system that so many of them have. I mean, they would be very surprised that I didn't have smoke and I didn't have horns um, and that I was a real conservative. I remember years ago when I was, uh, I hosted a dinner in Hollywood, or actually Charlton Heston hosted a dinner for me in Hollywood. And there were writers and directors and producers there, and they all knew each other, and they were all you know, conservatives. But the interesting thing was, I, at, at, in the table right in front of me as I was speaking, as I was getting ready to speak, there were some people chatting around the table, and they all were friends. It's clearly, they're all friends and associates. And I heard one person reach over to the other and say, I didn't know you were a conservative. And it was like making the sign of the fish. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I, I think that that is going on today um, in the news media. Uh, you, you've, you've got these, you've got an industry where it's not just professional, but it is personal. It's, it's the social world. That's all they know. They, they're, they, they, they're in Manhattan. They all work at the same network. They all think the same way. And at the end of the day, they believe they're the mainstream. 
you know, I, I don't like the term mainstream media because they're not mainstream. They're, they're far to the left, but they don't see themselves that way at all. What I would say to them is hire conservatives. Bring conservatives into the fold. Make sure that they are professional. Make sure that they know how to be reporters because there are some conservatives who don't know how to be reporters either. Go back to journalism. Bring them in and see what happens to your product when you have to include them in the equation. What's going to happen is very good things are going to happen. Is it in their business model? Because the New York Times has seen an uptick in their subscriptions, uh, print and digital. And it was the same thing under Bill Clinton with National Review, where National Review, when Clinton was going through the impeachment, they saw quite an uptick uh, in playing the opposition role. Do you think to some extent there is a, a financial incentive for them to continue to, to play an opposition Perhaps. resistance? Perhaps. Um, you see in this... In the, in the world today, let's, let's look at the, the cable networks. Um, whether it's Fox, CNN, MSNBC, clearly all of them, all of them are motivated. Uh, Fox is not completely, but, you know, with Sean Hannity and Laura Ingram, it's very pro-Trump, unquestionably. Now, Shepard Smith is not in the afternoon, so it's not, it's not as, as uh, one-sided as CNN or MSNBC. But they've all made business decisions, and they, they, they are each saying, I can carve out a certain uh, piece of the, of the pie for myself. But I think at the end of the day, CNN has to be, I know they're looking at their numbers, and they're saying, our pie slit, it's a sliver. I mean, the cap won't even get filled by, by how little we have of that pie. So I don't know that that formula is working for them. You know, Fox is making a fortune of money, so it is working for them. But you know what's missing in all that? Journalism. Oh, they're, they're, if you look at these 24-hour news networks, Fox, MSNBC, CNN, how much time is being spent on real news reporting? Very little. Very little. And that's, you know, that's, they, they will say we're giving the market what the market wants. Unfortunately, it might be true. Maybe the market doesn't want news. All right. Well, Thank you so much, Brent Fazell, for joining us here uh, to talk about your book, Unmasked. Uh, we hope that our viewers here on C-SPAN will, will take a look. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me.